In my years of teaching, one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard was when you ask your students if they have any questions to wait for at least nine seconds and that usually someone will raise their hand. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> You know, uh, map mapping the carbon footprints in terms of the products and uh, labeling products. So is it more about mitigation, it seems, uh, and less about the adaptation? Or do you also have worked around the adaptation aspects? Right. You're absolutely right that it's uh, less about adaptation because it's already the result, uh, the amount of CO2 emitted uh, during the production of the product. So it's already the result of adaptation or non-adaptation of the uh, mm, uh, production uh, to, to the climate change obligations. That you're absolutely right that this labeling is uh, more, uh, less about adaptation and more about just the amount of CO2 emissions. However, it affects the consumer uh, when consumer, especially like um, well-known consumer, um, uh, see two products, two similar products, uh, and see that this one was produced with big amount of CO2 emissions, and the label says directly uh, about this, and the other one was uh, uh, carbon neutral, then the consumer may prefer the other one which is car carbon neutral. But prices also, they matter. They matter and it doesn't work uh, sometimes effectively. Lindsay, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me, Lindsay? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but I have to leave. Uh, so again, uh, with uh, sincere thanks to all of you and uh, also very interesting to hear Dr. Uh, Daria Boklin. It was a pleasure to share this uh, panel with you. And I, again, I wish you and the forum uh, great success. I'm sorry I have to leave. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. I would like to, if, if I may, pose um, a broad question to our two remaining speakers. Uh, as I alluded in my opening comments, uh, I think for many of us, we see uh, many of the ways forward in terms of uh, combating climate change as being both technically and economically feasible at this point, uh, but the question still remains of where do we find political will? And I would be very interested to hear from each of you uh, what your thoughts are on how do we locate political will at this point? Uh, Dr. Buckland, would you well, like to start? Yes, it's, it's a hard question, I should say, political will, because it depends upon so many things. Uh, well, um, in my research, I found out that uh, this will can be, uh, well, can be found and uh, can exist in case um, we found very, not only social and purely, let's say, environmental is incentives to combat climate change, but also economic incentives. And it could be um, shown by the politicians that it could be, it will be economically beneficial to preserve envi environment in general and climate in particular. It is economically beneficial. Also, it's mm, probably in the, not in the nearest future, but in the f future. And uh, to show that uh, it, it's, it should be taken into account as economical benefit, and in this respect, it would be easier to mm, like uh, incentivize the, the process of applying measures aimed at combating climate change. Uh, and also, uh, as soon as topic is hot, uh, it could be, and it is usually used as a populist tool, unfortunately. And the problem is that it's easy to say and what is done after the election passed. So uh, therefore, the more beneficial uh, particular measure is, the more probably likely it would be uh, really applied in practice. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Patterson, would you like to weigh in on this? Yeah, thank you. I, uh, my, my instinct is always, as a card-carrying political scientist, to say political will is not a very useful concept. Um, it's uh, that's unfair. Uh, it's certainly unfair to you, obviously. But the the um, I think the best way to see it is that but anything that we might encapsulate and observe and say there seems to be some political will on this bit of the problem is an effect, not a cause. 
right? So what we have to ask ourselves is what are the different types of actors involved and what might, where, where might they be coming from and how might, you know, let's say if you're, uh, if you're working in an environmental NGO, you're working in a, in a, in a, in a, in a think tank slash foundation, for example, then what is it that I can do that makes other people do different things, right? And so the incentive structures and the motivations of all sorts of different actors have to be understood, right? The incentives of Gazprom for, or Statoil or any of the big oil companies, many of which are state-owned or semi-state-owned, um, are very different, right? And so there, there is, I mean, I would, if, if, uh, Mr. So Samad was here, I would contest some of that, what he said, because I don't think it's the case that, for example, the, the idea of inclusive multilateralism is, can be, in the end, useful, right? We do need Shell Oil not to exist in 30 or 40 years time as an oil company, right? We need that to be, we need oil and gas to be basically incredibly minimal down to the utter irreducible things that we that are really really hard to do without those fossil fuels so that the russian forests can do their job right if the if the oil and gas operations in russia are still high then then it's sort of negated right the the, the, the forest bit of the picture is sort of irrelevant um so so i think taking account the the different positions the different incentives the different motivations of different actors and for most people then that becomes a question of what can i do right or what can i do collectively with the people around me and most of us as citizens that's going to be through campaigning that's going to be through organizing locally uh, because that's where most of us have any sort of impact um, and political will is then going to be the effect of that um, some of that is then also at the level of political leadership if we want to use that word instead it seems to me that any political leader who has either some sense normatively that they want to do something good uh, for the climate, and they want to take us take the country that they're they're leading, um, or involved in its politics in a low carbon trajectory or zero carbon trajectory, um, and they have a variety of electoral, religious, all sorts of motivations that they might come to that themselves. But they also are structured, right? They're not free to just do whatever they want, right? They they're, they're responding to various pr pressures, then. What is the situation that's specific to those countries that um, enable them to do something, right? That, so, for example, in the UK context, where I'm, I've, I've, I worked in Canada for a long time, for us, which always, always on the forest oil question is always basically the same as Russia. Right? They, they just basically tell the same story about the oil and forests relationship. Um, but, but in in those countries, the, the the situations of the political leaders are very different. You've got both places. You've got political leadership, which for the most part has wanted to tell a good story, but the UK has reduced its emissions by forty seven percent, and Canada's emissions are about stable since nineteen ninety. So they're very different outcomes, even with the same intent. If you just read the speeches of the politicians, and the difference is is that the the um, the UK used to have an awful lot of oil, uh, coal in its electricity system and the crude story is that a, a, a right-wing government of Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s decided they wanted to destroy uh, they wanted to destroy the coal miners trade union um, for political reasons and that that meant there was no sort of lobbying power block for coal when 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 we got into the 2000s and the UK wanted to well early on it said it created the position for then conservative politicians to say oh we can pretend climate UK is a climate leader wasn't because they wanted to do that it was because the, they already were on a emissions were on a downward trajectory because we were shifting away from coal to natural gas and then a bit later on from coal to renewables and and so that enabled the presentation of the UK as a leader as having political will but it was really because now it's the situation where lots of UK government UK governments are saying well we're already you know got a pretty good track record compared to most countries but we want to go the next step and now we have to do the harder things and how do we do that, right? And how do we use the situation of the particularities of the UK situation where we've already decarbonized quite a lot, but we want to do more? Where are the economic opportunities? So, so it's identifying the multiple, the economic opportunities, the new businesses that might grow, the, um, the social opportunities, how it might, uh, you know, and with some of which are crudely political, right? So the current UK government has been very clear of saying we're going to have a green industrial revolution and where they are citing the new wind turbine manufacturing plant or the new uh, electric battery for electric vehicles plant 
is in constituencies they want to win at the next election. It's very crude. So sometimes it's, you know, it's multiple things going on that might then appear to us as political will. Um, so I think that's what I would say about that. Thank you for those comments. I think Dr. Bogdan yeah. would like to follow yes, up. Yes, thank you very yeah. much. And I would like to yes, let you raise some <coughs> thoughts in my head. Yes, because, you know, political will is such a tricky thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, uh, climate change <laughs> agenda sometimes misused. Uh, for instance, a recent WTO jurisprudence uh, um, pump up uh, another problem. Uh, uh, Indonesia, just a couple of months, has lost the case against the uh, European Union. European Union was the complaint, complainant, Indonesia was the respondent. Uh, EU, Roma, uh, Indonesia, raw materials, it, that is the case. And the problem is that uh, Indonesia banned export of its raw materials to the European Union. Why European Union needs raw materials from Indonesia? To produce lithium batteries. Why European Union need lithium, needs lithium batteries? To produce electric vehicles. Why European Union needs electric vehicles? To combat climate change. But what happens in Indonesia? Due to the, uh, this intensive extraction of raw materials, it's very dangerous for the environment. It causes harm to the biodiversity, deforestation, and Indonesia, one of the less countries, few countries in the world, which still has uh, rainforest, tropical forests. And when uh, we extract tropical forests, we multiply biodiversity loss because they're very rich in biodiversity. And also contamination of water. Biodiversity, deforestation, contamination of water. And Indonesia, as a result, get huge spaces of totally degraded uh, part of, of uh, uh, the tropical forests. Therefore, it seems that countries need these uh, uh, materials, uh, rare earth and raw materials, to combat climate change on the one hand, at the expense of the other countries, developing countries like Indonesia. And this problem cannot be solved by the WTO jurisprudence because Indonesia totally lost the case, every claim, and all uh, justification tools for this um, uh, situation didn't work. Therefore, where is the political will? Whose political will in this case should be uh, applied? European unions? That's a question. That's a tricky situation. Therefore, it's not such a straightforward, you know, uh, problem uh, of combating climate change. It is very complicated because I think here in Bhutan, uh, you know better than us how everything is in interconnected uh, on the planet and how every step sh should, should be done with the very, very cautious, we should take very cautious steps. And this uh, whole system of co combating climate change uh, should be taken account as a system, but not as a separate steps of separate states to pursue their own interests. So that is the problem of uh, political will, and I think uh, it's more about us, about scholars, uh, to develop such tools to see this situation, to provide concrete decisions for politicians, and uh, to show them what is effective and what is necessary to be done. And therefore, such conferences is a huge contribution, indeed effective contribution on, on this path. So thank you very much again for organizing and providing such opportunity to discuss these problems. Thank you very much. And I think that also speaks a bit to uh, Dr. Uh, Adil's comments this morning about moving from thinking internationally to thinking globally, right? Uh, and kind of where will exists in that, in that translation or in that movement. Uh, we still have uh, just a couple minutes left. Uh, yes, Dashrullah. Uh, uh, th th thank you, Lindsay. Uh, uh, while the topic is on, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, trade and climate change, I have a question on that uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the problem of climate change is caused by the developed countries. So uh, the emission debt, whether you call the adaptation debt uh, and uh, the loss and damage debt, they're all created by the developed countries. Now, when we look at these two, I again see uh, in terms of uh, the uh, terrestrial emission and imported emission. Now, the developed countries are offshoring 
the polluting industries. And then they're declaring that they are, uh, you know, going carbon neutral, uh, achieving net zero. But then if you look at, again, their imported emissions, uh, UK, I read somewhere, it would constitute some 40% of their emissions now, if you look at. So if you look at that now, how this new problem, how do you resolve? While all of us have to, in fact, uh, try to work towards net zero by 2050, uh, but because of this offshoring and uh, because in some ways the less developed uh, and the LDCs in particular are enticed by this offshoring and they're getting, in fact, into a bigger track. So how do we resolve that? Thank you. That's, that's a complicated question. I, indeed, I, I would also raise it, but I don't have the direct answer. I would say that uh, it's a trap. Uh, it's easy to put the product, not easy, but it's common to put your production, dirty production offshore on the territory of the different country. Uh, uh, that's the first step. Then extract resources you need to produ uh, for uh, production to combat climate change. And this developing country left with dirty production and w with extracted natural resources. My idea was to develop, some, well, universal tools, instruments like, uh, uh, not mine, but the, the, this idea of many international lawyers like uh, carbon labeling, carbon taxation, uh, this possible uh, uh, approach to likeness of the products. So universal uh, uh, instruments, uh, subsidization of the also kind of a tool. But uh, we should look at, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, applying these tools uh, on non-discriminatory basis but it's a really complicated, it's a trapping situation because you, you're defending one thing, but you're uh, harming the other thing. And this balance is really, really, really hard uh, to, to find. We, we should be very cautious uh, applying one measure or, or another. I don't have direct question to this, uh, direct answer to this question. If, if I would, I would be Nobel, uh, I would win the Nobel Prize probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. But I think yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. No. Yeah. I, I'd love to come in on that. In fact, uh, yeah. I mean, I agree totally. It's a it's a really intractable problem. I think one of the difficulties the UK has come in a lot of stick for that because we are also the most deindustrialized countries of the of the industrial of the of the industrialized world. So people saying, oh, well, you just cut your emissions because you exported your industry elsewhere. Now, I think that's that bit of the picture is slightly a mistake, or at least a mistake in one sense, is that the reason for those, that that relative de the, the offshoring, as the question put it, of industry over the last, what, 50 years or so, um, has mostly been driven by labour costs and transport costs, right? It's easier to move, it's easier and cheaper to move things around the world, uh, and it, and, and there are increasing inequalities of, of, of labor costs and of relatively skilled labor costs so that you get that offshoring for that reason right so that's sort of globalization or whatever um it is also the case that many of those manufacturing processes are whether it's in textiles or shipbuilding or steel manufacture or cement or a variety of other bits are themselves quite highly polluting both in carbon terms but also in terms of the local effects on water and air pollution and health and so on um, but it's not necessarily that they are exporting those emission those industries because they are polluting that's not the driver that's an if that's a sort of side effect i think um but it does just does make this massive sort of accounting problem right where do you distribute if i if i've got a fridge downstairs which was manufactured in korea which is quite likely to be the case but i don't know um then where does the emissions where do we account for the emissions in the manufacturing of that and then that feeds into all sorts of the trade conflicts that um, um, that Daria was talking about. Um, there's also, of course, the counter one at the moment, which is exemplified in the example of your Indonesia Euro EU conflict as well. But it's more general that what's going on at the moment in most Western countries is a reshift back to what we call industrial policy or industrial strategy, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, um, the European Green Deal, which I suspect is associated with the conflict that you were talking about. And so you've got both ways, right? They're now actually trying to re-import industry, reverse the process, the question, not completely reverse, but reverse in some ways at least, because they want to get the gains of, there's a political dynamic within their countries. They want to get the, the economic gains of the political shift, of the shift towards green energies, you know, solar, renewables, electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and to, to sustain the political coalitions domestically, they want to say, well, there's going to be jobs in this, uh, in the US or in Germany or wherever. Um, and so they need, and, and that's been driving that shift back to trying to reshoring, onshoring, or now in the context of the Russia-Ukraine form, uh, or uh, war in particular, they're talking about friendshoring, right? It doesn't have to be here, but it has to be with one of our allies. So there are all these processes, which also then will generate new sorts of conflicts. Um, all of which is to agree it's really intractable. I, I think it's it's also more complicated than becoming simply, uh, for the, some of the reasons I gave earlier on, than solely a north-south, global north, global south, develop, developing, whichever dichotomy you want. Um, there are now a reasonable number of industrialised countries. It's the case that I think if you did consumption-based accounting, as the question was suggesting, Canada, for example, would be, benefit from that. It would be a net. It would it, its emissions would go down if it did. Uh, whereas most Britain, absolutely Britain's or most European countries, the emissions would go way up if they were doing that consumption-based accounting. Um, whereas there are some developing countries who would be who would look rather bad from a um, you know uh, from a if you did consumption-based accounting. So it it gets quite murky in, in the details, but it is a really difficult problem. It's an expression of that problem of inequalities that I was talking about earlier on. I think. Thank you for that. So on that note, we have basically reached the end of this session. Uh, as you can see from uh, the breadth of this conversation, the uh, politics of climate change, we could spend another three days talking about uh, from various different angles uh, and depending on how you defined uh, politics and how deep you want to dig into it, right? Uh, but uh, this has been a very illuminating conversation. Thank you, Dr. Brooklyn, and uh, thank you, Dr. Patterson, if you are still with us. Uh, and so uh, please join me in offering our appreciation for their comments. Thank you.